goodness and your grace. We thank you for the gift of salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this morning, which you have brought us to, that we may learn and educate ourselves and that we will understand what is Christianity, where the roots, where the historical events take place, God, and, and not the version that maybe some of us may have been taught or we assume by what we saw, God. And so we just thank you for the enlightenment we're going to receive today, the truth that we will receive today, and I pray that you would use it to equip the body of Christ. Bless our speaker this morning, and we just bless all who participate, and we give your name to honor. All right, there we go. There we go. All right. Like they say, the devil not going to get the victory. <laughs> well, again, welcome. We are doing a hybrid model, so hybrid model. So we do have uh, people who are online as well as those of you who are here. And so what that means is if we have questions that are in the sanctuary, we will ask that you would use the mic. I know a lot of you might not want to use the mic and think you're loud enough, but you won't be loud enough online. And so we want to make sure we capture that. We are recording this as well. And so that way uh, it will be there. So please uh, bail yourself with that. If you're unfamiliar with our, uh, our facility, our bathrooms are located in the front uh, lobby as you came in. Um, to my right is the men and to my left is the women's. And so you can uh, uh, know where those are if you need them. So today's topic is going to be addressing the whitewashing of Christianity. And some of you may ask, or some have asked, why is this a big deal? Uh, you know, does it really matter uh, what Jesus looks like, right? And I just want to share one perspective that I encountered uh, years ago. And some of you all know about Zion. We were using the Truth Project uh, as for some curriculum for our small group study. And I remember one particular evening, I had people over my home to go over uh, the lesson for that evening. And part of that video, showed uh, it's supposed to be history in the Bible of people and all these white faces were being displayed. And so well, I had one brother there who just could not get over the fact that everyone in that video looked white. And I, I had a hard time getting to the lesson because of the images that were being displayed and trying to talk with them about the importance of what the truth we're going to know and not to hang on to the images. And so that's a very real reality for a lot of people, is that that becomes a barrier uh, to even our, uh, our evangelism and trying to share those things uh, with one another. So we, we definitely know that this is important. It's also important for the simple fact is that as Christians, the truth should matter to us, right? Uh, we should strive to be accurate in our imagery as well as our history. And so my hope is that this seminar will help us toward that goal. And so you will have opportunities to ask questions. I know you may have some. And so there'll be a couple of periods where you'll do that if you're online. Throughout the whole seminar, you can type in your questions. Uh, our moderator will get, gather those up. And so those questions will be asked. And then if we do have some that would like to ask questions verbally, uh, when those times come, you can just unmute yourself. Uh, and you'll be able to ask those questions as well. Well, I'm excited to uh, introduce our speaker. He's no stranger to us here at Mount Zion. He has uh, come before and done a, at least two other uh, theological seminars. In fact, we need to come back and do part two for that dating one. Uh, we haven't forgot. Uh, so, but the pastor, Jerome Gay, he serves as the lead pastor at Vision Church in Raleigh. And he has a Bachelor's of Arts in Communication at St. Aug, and, uh, St. Aug College, and a Master's degree in Christian Studies and Ethics from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. He is the author of two books, both are outstanding, Renewal, uh, which is a book on Ruth and the whitewashing of Christianity. And so some of you have already picked up the book. I would encourage you to do so. Uh, I think he's got some books here with him today. So if you want to grab one before you leave, I will definitely encourage you. Uh, like we've been saying, some of these questions come up and we don't know how to answer. We know, we believe that what people are and objections are saying is not right, but we just don't know how to answer. So I'm just excited that Pastor Jerome has provided us with the receipts. The receipts to say 
here is what we know to be true historically, theologically, and it's accurate. So he's done a lot of work, a lot of research, and so I think you will find the book will be a great addition to your library. Uh, Pastor Rome is married to his lovely wife, Crystal, and he's the father of Javari and Jordan. And so we're very excited. So please, please help me welcome Pastor Jerome Gay Jr. All right, I'm on. Okay, great, great. Well, good morning, Mount Zion family. Uh, those that are here and those that are online, uh, thank you, Pastor Harris, for this opportunity to come back and share. And I appreciate uh, this the opportunity to come here and, and talk about this topic. It's a very important topic. I know Pastor Harris prays. I always want to pray the Spirit move me out of the way uh, before we share. So let's pray one more time, and we'll dive in to what we have today. Father, uh, we are grateful that we are saved by grace through faith, and that alone, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, reminds us that it's not by works. So there's nothing that we can boast in ourselves, uh, but we lay all our chips on the cross, Father. At the foot of the cross, the playing field is level, and we are grateful that by your own volition, you chose to make us your sons and your daughters. So now move me out the way, God, that I would preach and teach on this very important topic because souls are at stake. Whitewashing contributes to lostness. And this is something all Christians, regardless of color or hue or ethnicity, should care about this. So God, use me for such a time as this for your glory. Let us have a wonderful time in you. I pray that I can honor you well. Give me keen discernment. Move by your spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, the whitewashing of Christianity. Uh, the, the Lord led me to write this because I was having a lot of conversations, in particular at the barbershop with young black men, uh, some young and some old, and many of them were saying, uh, the phrase we've been hearing a lot now is the phrase deconstruction. And deconstruction in most cases means demolition. They're demolishing their faith, and one of the primary reasons that we keep running into is whitewashing. We are inundated with white imagery to represent African and Middle Eastern people. Uh, and then when we confront this, we're given the response, well, why does race matter? And so what we have to see is, uh, it's interesting that people would ask the question, why does race matter, when they already use race in their favor? And so people on the outskirts, now while we know, those on the inside know that it's not a white man's religion, we know what Revelation 1-9, Revelation 7 says, all tribes, every tongue, every nation, but we're, we're called to be salt and light to the world. And so that, that's the heart. The heart behind this is evangelism. And I always say this, the answer to whitewashing isn't blackwashing. Amen, somebody. The answer isn't to blackwash the Bible either. Uh, it has always been a global faith that finds its roots in the Middle East and Africa and then moved out west. But the version of Christianity we're given in America as if it went the other way around. Are you with me? And so this is what led me uh, to write this. And so uh, when, when I was writing this, I was reminded, even though it's a little bit before my time, anybody remember Good Times? Uh, good Times, 1974, they did an episode called Black Jesus. And JJ, pretty much kind of the star of the show, had painted this black picture of Jesus. And uh, on, on my left, my left side, Michael, uh, Michael saw this black picture, that was JJ's brother. And he took down the white Jesus that they had on the wall. And he put up a picture of the black Jesus that J.J. had painted. And everything was well, the Florida got home. Uh, Mama comes home, Florida comes in, and she is furious. And you can see the picture on my right of her pointing to the white Jesus. But, but she said something important in this scene. She's pointing to white Jesus, and she says, this is the only Jesus I know. Pointing to white Jesus. This is the only Jesus I know. This is the one thing he don't need is a partner. Because they, they tried to compromise. Well, let's just put the white, let's put the black Jesus next to the white Jesus. And, and she said, no, he doesn't need a partner. And so we have to ask the question, why is white Jesus the only Jesus we know in the West? And that's because we've been forced. This, this imagery, because people argue, well, well, I can obviously everyone, you got Chinese Jesus, you got a, uh, but, but black people in particular were forced with white images of Jesus. And so when she says, white Jesus is the only Jesus I know, then she tries to end the, the, the conversation. She says, close the subject. 
and Michael grabbed the book of, of Revelation, where it talks about having skin like bronze, and, and just, just for context, that has nothing to do with Jesus' skin. That verse has nothing to do with Jesus. That, that's not a verse to say that Jesus was black. But but he you reach that verse, and again, they don't understand necessarily uh, exegesis. And so she says, oh my God, it do say that, don't it? It do say that, hair like wool. It says hair and head. That mean this part. Uh, hair and head like wool. Um, and then skin like bronze. But it, that, that verse is really about his judgment. It's, it's analogous. It's an analogy. And uh, not describe now again, he would have been a Middle Eastern brown skinned man, but but that, that holds no salvific weight. But listen, it does hold anthropological weight in terms of how people process the person of Jesus. And we know he's fully fully man, right? And he's fully God. Colossians 1 15, Titus 2 13 says he's our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the Greek word is homo Lucius. He's fully God, and he's fully man. Uh, but, but it oftentimes his skin, his humanity has been whitewashed. And there have been historical efforts to associate Christianity with whiteness. So what is whitewashing? Now, I hope, hopefully you can see that. I'm, I'm going to read it. Whitewashed Christianity refers to the affinity of white Christian scholars to dominate the Bible, Christian art, literature, and history with white people at the expense of authentic ethnicity and true scholarship in order to resonate most deeply with white audiences, primarily based on their experiences, presuppositions, and worldviews. And in essence, whitewashing, in a sense, is a partner of white supremacy. Because we want to associate purity, femininity, biblical masculinity, and Christianity with white people and whiteness. And there was a, a, an intentional effort to do this. And we must, we must unpack this. Now again, this is diabolical and sinful. Whitewashing is something that all Christians, not just black and brown ones, should, should confront because it presents Christianity in a monolithic way. You say it's a faith for all people, but you only present one people. So what we're saying, like, let's, let's present this and get this right. So we have to ask, so the thing that people are wrestling with when it comes to this whitewashing thing, and why we see the rise of Hebrew Hebrewism, why we see a lot of people deconstructing their faith, why we see the rise of African spirituality, is because when they look at Christianity in the West, generally speaking, black and brown people don't see themselves. And so when you go to our movies, you go to our children's book, whitewashing starts very early. Even in my, my son's Christian school, uh, Look, we're white Jesus, 12 white disciples, white Abraham, white Moses, white David, white Mary, white Joseph, goodness gracious. And it starts real early and it does, but race doesn't matter. You start real early conditioning people. And so where should our identity start? We want to stay biblical here. Identity starts here. Genesis 126. Uh, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So that's where identity starts is with our creator. And what we pull from this is that we have been created by God. And God creates us, listen, for himself. And this is important because we're going to get to slavery. He's, we're created by God, created for God. We're valuable to God. We're used by him and we're defined by him. And what we see is people are searching for their identity. And what people are saying is because Christianity is so whitewashed, that this really isn't a faith for us. And so those of us that are on the inside, in particular, the black or brown apologists or evangelists, a lot of times you'll find you have to explain why you're a Christian because some people see Christians as clean. Some people associate Christianity with someone who is subservient. And so, but because of all this, we got to begin to really dig in and, and know, know our history. Know our history. Know, know why we believe what we believe. Not just an emotional experience, but we got to know our stuff. That's what the, the Bible says. Uh, he has given us everything for life and godliness through knowledge. People always stop that he's given us everything for life because it's through the knowledge. In other words, you got to know what you believe and why. Not just feel what you believe, but know 
what you believe and why. And so that verse is commonly referred to as the Imago Dei, which means the image of God. And so we, we all share a commonality as image bearers, all people of all race, okay? There's, there's, no, there's no favoritism in the book of James uh, in Christ. But because of sin, this has, this has been done. And so the opposite of the Imago Dei, the image of God, is Imago Sui, which is the image of self. Now, if you're following along, you're hearing a lot of talk about critical race theory. So whenever you confront white supremacy, you're, called, you're automatically labeled a critical race theorist. But the real issue is what's called social identity theory. And it's a theory that, that builds value of people based on, ex, on, on their external experience, uh, external upbringing. Uh, so this causes people, Margo Sui causes people to, evaluate, uh, to value people externally. It's important to understand this because as we get to black and brown value, the reason I wanted to start with the verse is because that verse historically hasn't applied to us in terms of how we were treated. And so now you have people going back and, and sadly they're relying on Google and YouTube as their research to walk away from the Christian faith. So many black people don't feel at home. Calvin Lockhart says this, one of the major psychological problems of the black man outside the parent continent of Africa is that while he can always say, I have a country, he cannot really say, I have a home. But so many don't feel at home here. And, and now why, why is that? It's because of the, the racism of whitewashing. So I want us to think of race in a, a spectrum. We talk about race. Everything isn't racism. Amen. <laughs> Everything isn't racism. I want us to think in a spectrum. And this is in my book. There's racial ignorance where there are people who genuinely they don't know. There's racial indifference. They don't care. There's racial insensitivity. They could care less. Then there's racism, willful hatred. And what whitewashing is, is willful hatred toward black and brown people. And sadly, the church was complicit. The church was complicit. So what is racism? Racism is the oppression of one group of people for the preservation of the perceived dominant group of people. It is the sin of partiality. And we want to put, we want to put text to it. So racism is James 2.9. It is the sin of partiality. James writes, there is no, do not show favoritism. Do not show partiality. So when you begin to say that one group of people is better or more valuable than another group of people, you're committing the sin of partiality. So because when we're having these discussions, people are going to say, well, where's that in the Bible? It's right there. That's where it is. So when you, when you operate this way, you're going against what the scripture lays out for you. Now, there were three sectors that have committed this sin and how we got to whitewash the political sector, the social sector, and the religious sector. Okay? And we're going to walk through this. So, the political sector, in terms of our judicial system, our government, there were literally laws against black and brown people in this country. The social sector, in terms of how we were valued and how we were seen. And then, thirdly, the religious sector. Are you with me? All right, so let's start off with oppression biblically so we can get a, have a biblical framework. So I always want us to have a biblical framework. Now, the person who gives us a biblical or a social framework of oppression is actually an African man by the name of Pharaoh. Pharaoh gives us a blueprint of oppression. Here's what he said. He said, he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Now, who is Pharaoh talking to right here? He's talking to the Egyptian. He's talking to his constituents about the Hebrew people. And I want you to notice what he does. He has to present one group of people as a threat in order to justify oppression. Are you hearing? He, ha he has to. So are we in the book? We're in the Bible, he gives us this blueprint. I have to present them as a threat in order to justify unjust oppression. So here's what he said, here's the layout. So here's, here's his breakdown, here's the anatomy of oppression. There, the Jews 
uh, are a threat numerically and structurally. Remember, he said it's too many. That's why they want to kill the men. That's why they want to kill the babies, right? The male babies, right? That they are. We, we have to. We have to get the men, the males, not even let them see life, but get them off course in order to destroy the fabric of society, destroy the family, destroy the men, and remove men. Then it, it leaves it leaves women out there. Not that women can't hold it down, ladies. Don't that's not not going there. No patriarchy here. Amen. Uh, but what I'm saying is, if you you remove that, then what happens is you break the fabric of the family. Then uh, they will overtake us, so we must oppress them. So we, because if we don't do this, they're going to do it to us without food, by the way. But if we don't do this, they're going to do this to us. We Egyptians must see them as a threat socially and economically to justify our oppressive acts. They're not worthy to be treated as humans, they are commodities. What's the goal? Control and domination. And guess what? White supremacists use the same playbook. We must present black people as a threat to our women. They just want to sleep with our white women. We must present them as a threat. They will overtake us if we don't oppress them. We must strip them of their native land. We must strip them of their history. We must strip them of their identity. We must break down their family. We must uh, dehumanize them in front of their wives and their children in order to break down their psyche so that we can control them. And they attempted to do this in the name of Christ. And this is what we must know, family. Because when, when people say, when they talk about slavery, and they talk about these things, it's important to understand the Bible does not condone chattel slavery. The Bible does use that word. But it's not, Paul is talking about something totally different. But when you're dealing with people now and they bring up slavery, you have to know that, yes, people did this in the name of Christ, but they were not Christians. Because the Bible says you cannot love God who you don't see if you don't love your brother who you can't see. So they might have done this in the name of Christ, but they were not representatives of Jesus. So we have to be able to confront this. Think of it this way. I can use a hammer to build, or I can use a, a hammer to beat. The hammer isn't the problem. It's the person holding it. The Bible is the word of truth. I can use this word to build, or I can use his word to beat. And so what they did is they used the word of God to beat down people. And, and as for us, I want to equip us. We have to know how to engage these questions about slavery, about what white supremacists did with the Bible, taking the Bible out of context in order to engage them with the truth. We got to be able to say, yeah, when Paul said slaves obey your masters, even if you don't believe in the Bible, this was written thousands of years before chattel slavery. So how could Paul have chattel slavery in mind when chattel slavery hasn't been invented, hasn't invented yet? Paul didn't have that in mind when he wrote Ephesians 6. Then I have white supremacy and white domination in mind when he wrote that, and black subservience in mind. So Pharaoh gives us this anatomy, listen, of oppression. Now, now let me be clear here. This is oppression, not necessarily race-based, because the Egyptians and the Hebrews were both brown skin. Uh-oh. All right, so, so this wasn't race-based. I, mean, I, I don't know how you think Moses will be a little white baby and Pharaoh ain't recognized. I'm just, I'm just, just help me out. A little white baby is going to tell don't nobody know this stuff. Right? It's just simple question. Right? And, and so I want us to see this, the, the anatomy of, again, I'm not saying this is race-based shadow slavery. This is oppression. They get an African man by the name of Pharaoh gives us the blueprint of oppression because uh, we believe the Bible to be a historic book, right? So, so here's, here's what we see here. Now, when, as a result of this, now we fast forward from Genesis 3, the entrance of the fall, sin, and how this begins to play out, we begin to see, even in scripture, um, at least colorism, right? Remember Moses' dark white, right? Uh, and, and, and you see, even the, the, the Shulamite woman in the Song of Songs, she has to affirm herself, I'm dark but lovely, she says in chapter one. Uh, you, you see colorism, where now there's this shadism of, yeah, they're brown skin, but you extra brown. And, and this turns into, over time, you know, race based slavery. And so this plays out in history. So, from there, you begin to see this idea of white as superior. 
And so uh, some of these names, you, you may not be familiar with Publius, Cornelius, Tacitus. Uh, he's heralded as a great Roman historian. Uh, uh, Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, uh, he gives us some of these categories of Caucasian and that sort of thing. Then Adolf von Karnak. And when we get to him, you'll, you'll see him as a person who, who really wanted to remove the black and brown contribution to the Christian faith. So th this is why a lot of our seminaries whitewash the African church fathers. They present them all, all, all as white men and women. All right, so let's first start with Tacitus. So uh, he was a uh, Roman historian, and he's the, he was the author of something known as Germania. Um, he said that Germanic tribes are free, listen, free from the taint of intermarriage. He stressed the superiority of Anglo-Saxon religious and political institutions. And, and Tacitus stressed the superiority of their institutions was in their blood. Now, Kelly Brown Douglas, uh, I suggest she has a book called Stand Your Ground. She goes into this a little bit more, but she calls this the Anglo-Saxon myth. And so Tacitus, this Anglo-Saxon myth is this idea of people with lighter skin, like we're, we're more pure, we're, we're better than other tribes. And so while he's heralded as a historian, what you'll find oftentimes is like things like with Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, these guys are heralded as great preachers, but they own slaves. And so usually those, those aspects of their history, they, they try to leave that part out. But then, but then when you talk about black theologians, they say, well, black, black liberation theology, what about white Christian nationalism? So that there always becomes this duplicitous view when it's white, oh, let's give them a pass, but when they're black, oh, he's a heretic. And you can see this, and again, no one can get a pass for heresy. The Bible condemns all heresy. So regardless of what the color of your skin, you should not get a pass for heretical views. But, but it's, it's interesting, when they're white, they're given a pass. So that's Tacitus. That's him. Once you get past Tacitus, you begin to have these uh, pseudo-scholarship arguments against the intelligence and the value of black people. One is teleology. Uh, this is a philosophical attempt to describe things in terms of their apparent purpose, directed principle, or goal. So during the 18th and 19th century, there was a revival of the argument of the oppression of black and brown people, and it was rooted in this philosophy known as the teleological argument. And the teleological argument purported that the creator, listen, intentionally made men unequal. All right? Two whites, he gave intelligence, to enable them to direct widely the activities of others. So they are, of course, the one coming up with philosophy. I always put these people on the top. To non-whites, guess what he gave them? Strong backs, fortified with weak minds, I put it, uh, minds, and an obedient temperament so that they may, uh, might labor effectively under the supervision of white masters. The origin of this thinking uh, can be traced back to Tacitus who wrote Germania. 98 CE. Are you with me? Blumenblatt. So he was a German uh, physician, a naturalist, a, psych uh, a physiologist, and an anthropologist. Uh, he's credited with coming up with race, uh, racially based categories Caucasian, white, Mongolian, yellow, Malayan, brown, Ethiopian, uh, black, and American, red. He based his studies off the degenerative hypothesis which sought to avert social decline by using pre, the pre-scientific method to find the lowest contributors to society. And again, who was always the lowest? Brown. It was always us. Black and brown are always the lowest. So you have this pseudo-scholarship rooted in the sin of partiality, James chapter 2, verse 9, but then picked up by scholars who then now purport this same myth in the name. We're going to get there in the name of Christ. Now we go from class to race. So the middle passage in 1619, same time thing, 20 people on that ship. Listen, between 1619 and 1660, uh, there wasn't a race, racially based slavery system. It was more class. By 1660, digital servitude was too expensive. Then the 1660s, Virginia and Maryland passed laws making blacks 
servants for life. For life. By 1710, the number of black colonies increased 50,000. By 1776, just let me celebrate that year. <laughs> Independence for who? They get mad because we, we want to celebrate Juneteenth. And then they call it critical race theory when you call out, this is history. You did this. So you create a problem, then get mad for being confronted by the problem you created. So 1776, again, we celebrate independence. There were 500,000. What was other 20? 1619, by independence, 500,000. By 1860, 4 million. In these three primary sectors that upheld slavery were the political, economic, and the religious sectors. I'm going to go to political sectors, and I'll, uh, I want to honor time. We'll go through this, and then I want to stop with some questions. The political sector. Chattel slavery preceded American democracy. I know there's a lot of history. Uh, guys, uh, my reference is best to tell you are in the book. Go behind and check uh, over 240 citations. Because when you're dealing with something like this, you got to have your receipts, because people don't want to dismiss it who don't want whitewashing on the they want to come up with a reason to dismiss this. The chattel slavery preceded American democracy. The structure and content of the original Constitution was largely based on an effort to preserve slavery while affording political and economic rights. Whites. Okay? Yeah, remember, we saw from Genesis, Genesis 3, sin, partiality. We're seeing how this played out. The southern slaveholding colonies formed a union on the condition that the federal government would not interfere with the right to own slaves. Federalism was used to support the institution of slavery and political power of slave holding states in the last state. This is why Thomas Jefferson could write all men are created equal while owning slaves and not feel an ounce of hypocrisy because black and brown people were seen as beasts and not people. Got that? So, so this is this is what we need to understand. So that listen, so that we can understand why people are deconstructing. So there's some good deconstruction of American whitewashed Christianity. We need to get away from that. But the problem is because of this whitewashed narrative, people are coming to the conclusion that Jesus was complicit in their whitewashing. And so what we need to be able to do is, I want to affirm your questions, and I want to affirm your frustration, but I must confront your conclusion. Because now you're blaming, you're blaming Christ for what people who call themselves Christians have done in the name of Christ, but Christ will have nothing to do with them in that sense. They still need redemption. And we got to understand this, because the, the, the generation millennials and Gen Z, a high emotional service is not enough. A praise break, not going to do it. A praise break, your, your grandchildren, or your children, a praise break, they, they don't care about this. They want to know, where was Jesus when this happened? And what, what I've learned to say, because they turn to African spirituality, I said, well, okay, so hold on, okay, where was Jesus when I was there? Okay, uh, where were your African guys when this happened? They didn't stop it either. So we have to learn how to not run from their doubt, not send people to hell if they have questions, and begin to know, again, it's through the knowledge. The Bible says this, 1 Peter 3.15, to give a reason for the hope that lies within you. That's where we get the word of apologia, a Greek word for apologetics, a defense of the faith. It says give a reason for the hope. Here's what this means that faith and reason can coexist. So when I get saved, I don't turn my brain off. I don't have blind, I don't just take pastor's word for it. I tell my people, go behind me. 
So because faith and reason. So the reason I'm still in this faith is because I understand that people have done things in the name of Jesus that have nothing to do with him. And I will not hold Jesus accountable for what his faith followers try to do in his name. And we have to be able to engage that and engage these questions. Are you with me? We're now, we're still in the political. I want to read a quote. I will say that I am not not have ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the black and white races. That I am not nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor qualifying them to hold office to intermarry with white people. And I will say in addition to this that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. And in as much as they cannot so live, while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior. And as much as any other man, I am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. Guess who wrote this president? Abraham. Thank you. He signed the Emancipation Proclamation because for the union, I could have cared about black and brown folks. So, but this is still, even history is whitewashed because these details are left out. And what's happening is our grandchildren, our children are, are using Google to go back and there. And, and, and again, our churches, this is why stuff like this is so important. We, we're not equipping our people in apologetics. You know, that, not saying I'm sorry, that means to defend the faith. And so when people ask questions, we say, don't question God. Well, who else are you supposed to ask? Right? Because the people in the Bible had questions. They, they doubted. They doubted right at the resurrection. Thomas, remember him? Guess who else doubted? John the Baptist. John the Baptist had the Holy Ghost in the womb and doubted. Matthew 11. Now, you don't want to show me looking for somebody else. I'm sitting here in this prison and you ain't got me out here. I'm in prison for telling this dude not to mess with his brother's wife. And Jesus, you ain't come get me out. Are you the one that shoots up with that? See, people wrestle with doubt in the Bible. So it is okay for your young ones, for you to have questions about suffering, about this mentality, about these things, about this history, and why are we giving this whitewash narrative? Here, Tom Skinner wrote a book, How Black is the Gospel. Uh, he wrote this in 1970, over 50 years ago. And he was dealing with the same thing I'm talking to you about right now. And he, uh, that's him. He said, the Emancipation Proclamation merely said the black man is not a slave and never defined him as a man. So you should say, hey, you're free. No counseling, no economic plan, nothing to process your trauma. Figure it out. And then we know they put in more law to get them right back. And so, again, we looked at social. I want to see this political because we'll spend the second half breaking down the religious aspect of this. It's important that we understand both. Why? Paul did. The evangelists, the apostles, they, they, they understood their times, the Bible talks about. They didn't lose their faith in the process. I'm not saying, look, it took me time to get all this stuff, but... I wanted to do this because I see too many people walking away from the faith, which means they're making an eternal decision based on misinformation that has been presented as fact in our seminaries, in our Christian schools, and in our churches. So this is this is what he pointed out. So two more, and then I'll stop for some questions. Michelle Alexander, the author of the New Jim Crow, that's that sister there. He said, since the nation's founding, African Americans repeatedly have been controlled through institutions such as slavery and Jim Crow, watch this, which appear to die, but are reborn in new forms, tailored to the needs and constraints of time. So this is why we talk about like redlining, right? Stuff like that that really hurt black people from home ownership, which was sanctioned. This was sanctioned. We talk about this stuff because they it just morphs. Then the church says, don't say anything about it. The only thing they want to talk about is abortion, which 
which is, again, we should, because if, if Black Lives Matter, they got to matter in the womb. Amen. But it's like, you're really pro-birth. You're not pro-life. You would care about my Black life outside the womb. Not just end. And so it morphs into these different things to keep us oppressed in many different ways. You know, it says this, the Virginia law stated, because we're going to wait, break our way to the religion. Virginia law stated that the conferring of baptism does not alter the condition of the person as his bondage or freedom. All right, so we talk a lot about social and political. Oh, black. We're getting ready to go now into religious, and this will spend the second half there. So I want to pause here to see if there are any questions. Will we have in the chat? Will we have in person? Then uh, Pastor Lee will do a break after this. Question. Yeah, we do. We do have some from the chat, and anybody online, you can also unmute and ask your question verbally. Also, but one question that that came through the chat is: Every decade, there's a focus on this. But not much change. What needs to happen to create actual change? What can this generation do differently? Yeah, uh, great question. We 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 have to stop whitewashing uh, through our imagery and through our knowledge of Christianity in Africa prior to colonization. And so we need to, one of the things that, like my wife and I did, we would work ourselves to color correct. And so I had original images made of the African fathers. We want to get to that in the second half. I put them on shirts. Um, we, we, we're doing things to get that out there. We, uh, I'm working on a children's book. We have, to, we have to create content that comes against this whitewashed narrative. So we have to begin to present a diverse nature, the, the diverse nature of the Christian faith from grade school. We have to challenge our schools to see this as important as well. I, I'm telling you guys about my my uh, children's school, and my son came home, you know, white Jesus, white white everything, and I'm, I didn't take him out of school. I met with the principal. I didn't call the principal racist. Um, again, racial that's spectrum, right? So I, I wanted him to understand what this does, because you're saying you want your school to be more diverse, but nothing in your books are, right? And so we had a good conversation. He, he began to say, hey, you know what? There, there's some things we need to do differently here to show the beautiful nature of our Christian faith. So that one discussion helped new curriculum get in my son and my daughter's school, which my daughter's generation, she's been seeing this year. She's not really benefiting from it, but the generations after her will. And so we have to do that. Black churches got to get rid of these white Jesus pictures because um, you got to realize what that represents for non-believers who may come to your church. They may never come back simply from seeing that. Uh, we got to grow in apologetics, things like this. We have to continue to equip our people. I put it in my sermons, because y'all know most people come on Sunday into Bible study or the prayer meeting. So the one where I got the biggest audience, I want to equip them to know what they believe and why. So those are a few things we need to do. But remember, this has been happening for centuries. So five decades isn't enough to curtail. This has been going on for centuries, so that's why. So we're we're getting there. Last thing is for those of you that are content creators, like there are a lot of uh, urban apologist content on YouTube. We got to realize that this is the way we're in. So like, I didn't care to start a YouTube channel, but I did it for evangelistic purposes. Sometimes you got to do what you don't want to do for the sake of souls. You can't only minister to your likes. You got to be willing to step out of your comfort zone for the sake of those that don't know Jesus. Great question. Any more questions? Yes, ma'am. You got one right now. I just want to know churches who do not share this information, but they see it as a as an issue because they want to diversify their population and say that we are a congregation of, of white people, black people, and so, but they, they, they skate across. They don't share the information. They don't talk about the history or even African Americans or blacks in America, what's going on in the world. How do we get past that? Because history is history. And a lot of times we focus more on the Bible, but you're not getting all the truth out of the Bible because you don't share this piece. What do we do about that? 
because you have the churches and things there, they're um, multicultural, but the population really ain't multicultural, but if you shut away from really telling the truth, the population is real life. Yeah. And, but you don't want to offend the one or two people in your congregation that may be white because if you don't share this information. How do we get past that? Yeah, you, we, we really have to have leaders that that aren't going to be held hostage by big givers or whatever the case is when it comes to sharing this information. So, for instance, I have white pastor friends that are beginning to deal with this stuff and they're losing conservative whites because what they're finding out is they're more conservative than they are Christian. Because they have conflated conservatism with Christianity and the church has been given a manifold wisdom, not the donkey or the elephant. And so they're, they're coming to that revelation that that they have a lot of conservative members who who want a conservative American church and not a biblical one. And so you have to be willing to lose people. The other thing is like, so we've seen a lot more diversity lately, which is uh, surprising. Um, and so there's a lot of more white families coming in. And I've just said, listen, um, biblically, I'm responsible for the black members and the white members of this church. So I, I, I can't show favoritism. Um, however, I'm still going to confront these issues that disproportionately affect black people. And I expect you as my family to join us. And so I think we have to present it in a way that's not, again, we can't label all our white brothers and sisters racist when it could be ignorance, right? Like they genuinely don't know. And we have these white people in a predominantly black church coming to learn. And so we got to make sure we have, a, we have to still be hostile to the scripture and have a loving posture in how we engage people and get space for white people to disagree and push back and say, and not assume that they're pushing back because they're racist because because perhaps they have some different views that I can benefit from. So I think we have to create that culture. And then lastly, we have to point out in particular white led churches that have, that will celebrate, celebrate black faces, but don't really allow black voices. They'll let you sing, but outside of singing and greeting, uh, there's no black leadership as it becomes to eldership. Now, he don't need to be eldership because he's black. He needs to meet the qualifications of First Timothy 3 and Titus 1. So I'm not saying just make him. But is there access for the leadership uh, to, to actually have diversity and to have those discussions? So because I have this conversation a lot. And one more thing, for, for the churches leading this way, in particular white-led churches, and if you're black in that space on the chat or whatever, you have to ask, do they really want to see? Do they want to see, or do they just want to be able to say, I passed a diverse church? They don't really want to hear the voices of the diverse diversity within that church. Do they want to see their blind spots? What I find is a lot of them don't. They, they, they don't want to see the blind spots. So, so they're, they're not going to say anything about police brutality. They're, they're not going to talk about duplicity within conservatives. They're, they're not going to do that because they'll lose their base. Um, and so they're they're held hostage by that. And when you see that, that 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 should be a deal breaker for you to go to an authentic community of faith. I'm not saying that black people can't be under white leadership. That would be racism. White people can't be under uh, I mean black people can't be under white leadership. But make sure that they affirm the Imago Dei in you and not only the image of God in their white conscience, they do for all of them. So we had a we had another one on our, and you may have already answered it. It says, "How willing are other faiths willing to acknowledge the truth about whitewashing?" Other faiths, other faiths. Yeah, I would say, well, depending on which which so if you engage, and so I'm I'm gonna say evangelism, generally speaking. Now, there are many different uh, voices in here, so don't label all of them as cussing people out on the sidewalk. That's not all the Hebrews are like. But uh, a, a, a huge section of Hebrew Israelism will confront whitewash. Uh, the nation of Islam has always <laughs> confronted whitewash. Uh, when you get into Yoruba and African spirituality, uh, it confronts whitewash. So the, the reality is Christianity has been the most reluctant. Christians have been the most reluctant to confront whitewash, while other faiths readily pointed out. And because a lot of times we're not prepared, like for instance, a Kier Sheard was on the Breakfast Club. And if, if anybody been for, uh, for the Breakfast Club, a lot of hands ain't go up. Uh, so the Breakfast Club, <laughs> the Breakfast Club, 
you need to know my audience. <laughs> the, the Breakfast Club is basically a, a, a radio talk show, but they also have a YouTube channel, all right? So think of it, they, they, they handle different topics. They bring famous people on. So y'all know Pierre Shea, Gossip Saint, his daughter, Aaron Clark Shea. Um, Charlemagne the God, he's kind of the star of the show. Uh, he was asking her about slavery and her faith. She really couldn't answer the question. She, she just stumbled. She, did, she didn't, I ain't talking bad about Kiki, but she just didn't do well. Didn't do well. And you literally got millions of people, and she just didn't do well. And my point in bringing this up is oftentimes the other religions know more about whitewashing than the Christians do. And we need to know about this. That's why I wanted to create this resource so that we can confront it. Because again, souls are at stake. Any other questions? Uh, let me know how much time we got past the week before break. Yeah, another one online. What is your view of the importance of race, the scriptures, and do you stress the importance of your congregation? So how? Yeah, so I, I think I see more ethnicity. Uh, which also in, in also includes culture, and like you, you don't see a text that says black, white, brown. Um, what you see is tribe, some nation. The Greek word is ethnos, which has to do more with ethnicity. Um, but you see in Acts 13, you see a diverse group of people. When Paul is commissioned, you have uh, Niger, you have a dude from Cyrene. You, you see this diverse group. You have Luke. Uh, in the Bible, the disciples of Greek. So you see diversity. And so we have to go based on the geographical standard. That's usually how we arrive at race. You don't have, hey, this person black. That's just not in the scripture. So I'm not going to add to the, the word of God. So what I want to do is I want to say, hey, race is a social construct. But it's one we can't ignore. It's a social construct that we cannot ignore. And so we need to be equipped in order to celebrate the different races of people that God has made. So that's how I do it. But I don't, I don't want to deify race either, because it's important that we don't make a feature my race, the fe a feature of who I am, the foundation of who I am. The foundation of who I am has to be Christ. Because if, if, if you emphasize race more than Christ, then you're going to have an ethnocentric church. And we got black ethnocentric churches and we got white ethnocentric churches where race becomes so it's they 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 never really get to the gifts, boost of the spirit is always, always oppression. And you got basically an oppression Olympic Sunday. It's like, hold on, like we 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 still gotta walk through the Bible. The Bible doesn't only deal with oppression, it addresses it, but it deals with other things. So I, I wanna be careful. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about race, but that's not the only thing I'm gonna talk about. So I let people know that I'm not, I'm not. I'm not doing, I can't address every unarmed black man every week. Can. Can. Do I care? Absolutely. Um, but I can't preach that every week. I gotta walk through this word. So that's that's how I, I acknowledge it, but I wanna be, again, I wanna be faithful to the scripture. We want to do one or two more. Right. Any more questions? Great questions, family. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, curriculum for children. Do you have uh, resources for young people? Bible dance. Yeah, so mine will be out to 2022. I signed a deal with New Growth Prep. Um, that's that's going to deal with more of the historical aspect of the Christian fathers and mothers called uh, my heritage. So that's mine. Uh, some of the gospel projects that I, I say they they started to come out with more diverse imagery. Uh, even if you go to New Growth Prep, I wanted to kind of look at their stuff before I signed the book deal with them to see they, they have more. But the reality is what we need, um, and this is disclosure, brother, but I would, I would really challenge us, uh, Black-led churches, to, to begin creating, to create it. Be because like, even when I was writing this book, um, none of the major publishers was down with it. They was like, you know, they, they don't see the need. So the, the challenge, brother, that we'll, we'll find is most of the publishing companies are white only. And so you have to then prove the validity and value. Uh, and oftentimes you're dismissed. 
And so we, we have to be able, we, we have the extra talent of, man, we just got to kind of create our own stuff because not everyone sees the value. And when you start including black images, a lot of the conservative Christians don't call you woke and then undermine and say, oh, you're trying to be woke. You've given into the woke agenda. It's like, it has nothing to do with woke. We're just trying to show the diverse nature of the church. So mine is 2022, but I, I would recommend the Gospel Project. They have some stuff that's uh, even the uh, the Jesus story of the Bible. They they started using kind of again different views, so it's not just um, one. You know, everyone's not painted as black. You want to take some more? Well, yeah, yeah, I, I can. I'll, I'll, y'all tell me. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm subject to the leadership here. Do you anticipate introducing the content or creating? Oh, man, I would love to. I'm I'm trying to get in. Oh, but I got some sisters clapping. <laughs> I, I I would love to do this in schools, in HBCUs, but also PWIs. HBCUs is the only black college and university. PWIs predominantly white institution. So I would I would love. I sent this to uh, a guy that does the scene on radio, who's connected to Duke. I'm trying to get connected. So if you know departments of education or history. I would love to get this resource in there because I think it's, I think it's, so yeah. But uh, yeah, y'all help, y'all help, uh, y'all pray for the Lord to open some doors. Pray for open some doors. Let's do one more. I do one more, then we'll, we'll go to break. All right, I'm just going to go, uh, Pastor Whitman. All right, all right, that's great. You guys can join uh, Pastor we're just getting started. We'll just take a quick, probably five minute break. Give you uh, restrooms again out front. Uh, to the right is the men, to my right, to the left are the ladies. You can grab some uh, dangerous coffee, anything. And so, uh, to know someone maybe you don't know here, uh, greet them. And we'll be back in five so Pastor Drone can have adequate time for the second half. Welcome, um, because there's a lot of great details in there, and I'm sure he's not going to be able to go through it all. And so that's why you have the book resource available. Um, but I would would just encourage you all to check out uh, Pastor Drone's books. Um, so his first one, Renewal, this was Grace and Redemption, the story of Ruth. Uh, just excellent, great book to use, personal study, Bible study, uh, Bible study groups. And if you'll notice, uh, I think I remember Pastor Rome saying he had to kind of fight for the imagery that he put on this book. And so Ruth is just not a little white European lady. Um, and so, again, just a great, um, great for him putting that resource out as well as, of course, the resource that we're talking about today. And so we're going to go ahead and get ready. But we do have a question, Pastor Rome. So as you come up, there's a question they wanted to get addressed before you get into the second half. And so. Uh, I'm going to ask Pastor Joe to come on up, and then I'll get uh, the mic to those who get ready to ask questions. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. In your uh, content that you have presented already, um, there was an indication about CE. Now, I've never heard of CE, which is Google it, it's common error, but where does that fall in relation to? AD and BC, because in the history of the church, CE has never come up. So could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so it's, it's really just another way um, to describe timelines for those that may not be religious. Um, and so you have, you know, AD um, or Anno Domini, which is the year of our Lord, BCE before Common Era is again, instead of saying before Christ, they don't believe that Christ exists for some and so they'll just so it's just another way to think through time without having a religious element within uh, how you frame it. 
Yeah. What, what did you say? CE? Uh, common Era. BCE before Common Era. Common Era. Yes, yeah, Common Era. Uh, E-R-A. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Before Common Era. And again, uh, AD is Anno Domini, uh, the year. Yeah, 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 yeah. Common yep. Era. Thank yep. you. All right. All right. Ready for session two? All right, let's get it. And so uh, I wanted to I want to now go to the religious side. We talked about the social and the political. We we'll spend the rest of our time talking about religious. And so uh, this is Tom Skinner kind of responding to what I read about the Emancipation Proclamation and how legally, not really until 1865, all God's image bears were at least declared free. It was not functional freedom because of the black folks and other things they had in place. Uh, but then the, the third sector that was complicit in demeaning and degrading black and brown values was the religious sector, so that's the church. And so one of the biggest culprits was this idea of the curse of Cain. All right, so, and I put myth there because it was, a, it was a myth in terms of how it was applied. And so here is the, 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 the idea or the ideology behind the myth. Because Ham was the father of black people and because he and his descendants were cursed, to be slaves because of his sin against Noah. Uh, some Christians says Africans and their uh, descendants, sorry, are destined to be servants and should accept their sad status as slaves in the fulfillment of the biblical prophecy. All right. So that again, this is what we would call uh, eisegesis. Now, the premise of the curse is that black and brown people of curse. So people of color. The reason I'm saying brown is the color. Cover a couple of other ethnic uh, ethnicities there. Uh, black and brown people are not human and don't have souls, and some went as far as to say incapable of salvation. Now, again, not everyone who embraced the curse of Ham myth said that, but some would even go as far as to say that we were incapable of salvation. And so, uh, uh, sadly, this was even in the Schofield Bible. This was in the Schofield Bible. And so, again, when you talk about you know, the black and brown experience in America, we literally have people trying to say that the Bible is saying that you guys are cursed and that everything that is white is pure. And it's, here's what they're doing. They're literally saying that God is contradicting himself because God is now showing favorites. They're, they're presenting God as a hypocrite, that, that he shows favoritism to people that he created based on the color of their skin. This is also the problem with Hebrew Israelite ideology is because they use Deuteronomy 28 to identify black and brown people as the original Hebrews, but our identity is based on us being cursed. So it's, it's the same premise as this white supremacist view of the curse of Ham. Now, here's the chronic eisegesis. So eisegesis is when you read into the text. We want to exegete, we want to pull from the text. We don't want to add to it. Proverbs said, do not add to the word of God. So the Bible says, curse be Canaan, Genesis 9, 25, which means only one of his four sons, not all four, were cursed. All right? Here's the other thing that we see in scripture. Curses have expiration dates. But when it came to us, we're supposed to be cursed in perpetuity. It's not supposed to end. So Exodus 20, verse 5, Again, this is also what we find in the law, right? That curses have expiration dates because even in the uh, Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, God was still merciful. Don't let people say that the Old Testament God was mean, New Testament God. No, same God, right? Same God. Here's your proof. Exodus 14, they go through the Red Sea. We don't get the law to Exodus 20. So this is great coming before the law, literally. He says, he doesn't say, obey me, then I'll let you through. No, I'm letting you through. Now, as a result of my grace, obey me. So the Old Testament God always shows grace. Now, Canaan's curse was fulfilled by the subjugation of Canaan by Israel, 1 Kings 9, 20 and 21. God's word says that disobedient curses can be reversed when people repent. So, so even if we embrace it, which we don't, but if we did, God allowed repentance. Y'all remember that's why Jonah was mad. Remember? Jonah was like, man, I knew you was merciful. <laughs> he literally got mad at God. I knew you was merciful and kind. Don't forget him people when they repent. 
who are you? He literally got mad at God first. Um, but, but he is a merciful God. You even, you even see that uh, when you look at just some of the things that happen in Chronicles. You see one, you see one of the priests literally bringing a demigod in God's temple. And he allows repentance. So, so God has always been merciful, but this is the eisegesis of that text. Um, so this is again the religious sector. Uh, this is too small for you to see, but but essentially this is from a book called Christ and Culture. And one of the things it says is that white Christian missionaries. When they would go into these towns or countries, I'm sorry, with people of color, they would often say that they would first need to be civilized before they could be evangelized. And by civilized, they meant assimilated in the white culture. That, that they, they have to see things and live and view things. And so if you're, your culture, our culture, black African culture was seen as barbaric, because it did not fit, and, and they needed to be civilized before they could be evangelized. So this is what we see, again, this is happening in church. This is, the again, the last part of this, uh, the, the church playing a role in that. And so now how do we get this imagery, and we only pretty much get a white version of Christian history? Well, one of the guys who contributed to this is this guy, Adolf von Karnak. Talk about people named Adolf. Adolf Smith. He's a German theologian historian. He argued against the African influence on the Christian faith. And you can find out more about this in the book, uh, the very next slide, uh, called uh, How Africa Shaped the Christian Mind. Thomas Oden addresses Adolf von Harnett. Uh, he ignored African influence in favor of a Eurocentric version of Christian history, and many scholars followed his lead. And so, uh, when you get to the, if those who have my book, there's a chapter called Whitewashing Africa. And what, what I do there is I talk about how scholars don't show the differences within blackness. And so they intentionally just use the word Ethiopian to describe any of the African Jewish tribes in the Bible. And so they just intentionally use just one word. They didn't allow variation. Now, they, they even would present Kushite, they presented them as slaves exclusively when they were also archers and soldiers. And so when, when the black presence in scripture is acknowledged, it still demeans. And so uh, people like him and others is like, they, they say race doesn't matter, but you see there's always this effort to make white culture seem better, even in Christian history and the acknowledgement of scripture. And so what we have to do, as a lot of your questions are, are, are you, you're seeing why this needs to be addressed, is recapture what Christ has already done. He's always used us and had us as part of his plan. But the Western church, Western church, has been complicit. Now, there are Orthodox churches that, that haven't given into this. But when we talk about Christianity here in America, uh, we've been given this Westernized version. So, Tom Zell says, so there's a copy of the book so you can see it. He says, major participants in Euro-American theology seem to have thus missed entirely the literary, the literary richness of the distinctive African Christian imprint on Proto-Europe and the formation of the Christian mind. Listen, these mistakes passed on through the graduate study programs have formed scholars of all continents subliminally. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, when you whitewash history, over time, people begin to see it as true and think it is normal. So whenever you think of something significant, it must be white. Well, whenever you think of something that, that's historically advantageous for all of human society when it comes to theology, it must be white. Whenever you think of the rich theological contributions of African theologians, they must be white. So here's what they did. They made Northern Africa, Southern Europe. Through the imagery. And now why do we even say Northern Africa? Think about it. We say something, oh, well, you know, the Northern ones are a little lighter and, and, and they're trying to make, there's always something when it's black. 
We got to explain it away. And so this is what you see. And that leads us to here. This historical eisegesis of the whitewashed of Christianity. Oh, oh. No, okay, yeah. The whitewashed of Christianity. So uh, in the middle, this is Pantene Pro BG. Pantene Pro BG. His beard is immaculate. Hair is done. Look like he got a perm. But he's inactive. And so what you have is you have, and you got Don Edwards and Duncan Edwards and George Whitfield, who again owned slaves. Uh, Whitfield went as far as to get on a boat to defend the institution uh, in, in the South, in Georgia. And then those two up there, you have uh, Athanasius and then Augustine. And again, they're, they're presented as, as white. And so that's what happens is we, we, we have to we have to erase this. And so many of us, because most of us came up, right? And this isn't taught. The stuff I taught you, again, the social political is not taught. And when you come into the church, this is not taught. Or if it is taught in seminaries, you're given white imagery, right? So then guess what happens subliminally? You just begin to accept it and associate, well, you know, yeah, I mean, it's a religion for all people, but he just didn't use all people. Pretty much only used my white system. That's what happens. And so again, the world is saying, so Jesus, if so black and black, black and brown people wrestling with their faith are asking that. So you're saying Jesus will save me. He wants nothing to do with it. When you present it in a monolithic way, and remember, you got to think about the non-believer. Too many Christians only know Christian needs. We have to be around. They ridicule Jesus for being around sinners. That's what we're supposed to be to be salt and light. You're not salt and light around other salt and light. You're salt and light in dark places. So this is what he called us to call where he called us to go. And so you begin to see. So this is actually one of the oldest images, but this is the image that we're given. This is. Yeah, another church father. This is how Augustine is presented. This is that's supposed to be to two up to Athanasius, the black dwarf. But that's not a black dwarf. Now that's my seminary book there. The bottom. That that's how the black dwarf, which was the nickname of Athanasius, the name given by his enemy. Now there's some arguments about that. Juster Gonzalez put that in his book, uh, Christ, uh, the history of Christianity. And that's how they're presented. And so we have to begin to say, hey, you know what? You're right. Christianity has been whitewashed, but it is not a white man's religion. We have to admit whitewashing historically, socially. But we got to say, no, this, this faith, in fact, and this is not to be mean, um, Dr. Dr. Waller, he says this, he says, the true academic task when you walk through the scriptures, it's finding white people, not black. Most of the, the region where people were reached, Europe needed to be evangelized. And again, we don't want to blackwash the Bible either. That's not the answer to whitewash. But just that's just when you, you study the geography for yourself, you're going to mainly find Middle Eastern and Africa. But again, that's just not reflected in our, at our image. Now, next is a video, so I want to I want to cue this up, make sure we can play this. So this is uh, the Breakfast Club. For those who didn't know what the Breakfast Club is, so this is Dr. Umar Johnson on the Breakfast Club. And again, he's not a Christian. Matter of fact, he just married two wives. He made them he made them fill out applications to to, to be his wife. So he just married two wives, and but he's he's a he has a, tons of followers. This particular video has millions of views, millions of likes, which means that people are affirming what he's saying. So I want you to see the effect of whitewashing for people who don't believe. So can we play it? Do I hit play? Can we play it? Got that? Again, powerful, passionate, and guess he attracts a lot of black men. 
because we in church, men on, on our hips, hands on hips, shouting. Where and again, I'm not against praise praise. Don't get me don't get me wrong. But 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 I'm saying like men are seeing that and that strength. That's knowledge. That's attractive. And in the church, we're offering this panting trophy Jesus. We don't answer, generally, we don't answer the question, not equipping the people in apologetic. And they're saying, well, well it, I, I can learn more out here than in the church. And so, uh, again, I, we, we need to know Paul knew the poets of his day. He said, it's in him we live, move, and have our being. And keep reading the verse, as some of your poets have said. That, that quote had nothing to do with Jesus. But he took a quote if he liked knowing a hip hop lyric, he knew the poets of his day. He knew the Dr. Umar's of his day. He knew the Migos of his day. He knew the Cardi B's of his day. And he said, all right, here's what they're saying, and here's the truth. So the quote was, it's him, and it's in, it's in Acts chapter 17. It's in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your poets have said. But he says, this is who this really applies to. This really applies to the one and only true God. And we have to be able to come into culture and say, yes, these things have happened, but what you're really looking for, black man, black woman, is you're trying to find your identity in African spirituality. You're trying to find your identity in Hebrewism. You're trying to find your identity in your body. You're trying to find your identity, but identity is found in your creator, and he loves, he affirms, he used you, he's used you in history, and he'll use you now. He just needs a willing vessel. He got to engage. He got to engage people to know what's going on. And so he mentioned slavery. So again, you go to my chapter in the book, The White Watch of Slavery. This is the biggest misnomer. Paul is not advocating the dehumanization of black and brown people when he says slaves obey your master. It's coming off the heels of the marriage verse one chapter before in Ephesians 5. And so what he's doing is he does orthodoxy chapters one through three in Ephesians. Then he does orthopraxy in chapters three through uh, four through six. And he's saying, this is what you believe. And here's what this looks like in your man. Here's what this looks like if you're a parent. Fathers don't provoke your children to wrath. Here's what it looks like. Watch this. You're an employee. Slaves obey your master. So this was indentured servitude in most cases. Now, was there been slavery during about time? Yes, there was. And what, what did God say? Even back in Exodus, he said, Man stealing is punishable by death, Exodus chapter 21, verse 6, down to verse 16. He always shunned abusive slavery. He shunned it. Even in 1 Timothy, he says, enslavers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? So, so the Bible never affirms that, but we have to run at this slavery thing, y'all. Because this is the number, there, there are pages called Black, uh, Black Atheists on Facebook, millions of followers. And the number one thing they hit on Christianity, a couple things. They hit Christianity up on how we, how they think we, that it's oppressive to women. And then they hit it up on slavery. And you notice what he mentioned, slavery. And we got to be able to say, yes, Paul wrote that. No, he did not have the transatlantic slave trade in mind when he wrote it. Yes, they use they use that verse to condone the transatlantic slave trade. No, that's not what Paul is saying. So we need to acknowledge the injustice, but then we have to exegete the text so that they know what it really means. Is that with me? All right. So uh, keep going. So the whitewashing of Christianity leads to the whitewashing of history, the whitewashing of scholarship, and the whitewashing of culture. When we do this, that that's what. When you, when you whitewash the faith, and because we're, we are a spiritual people, right? We're also a communal people. Black and brown, we're spiritual, we're communal. I mean, all people are technically, right? He breathes in the spirit of life. All of us are spiritual. We're all made for community. Let us create man in our image. So we're made in the image of a communal God. We exist for biblical community. But when you whitewash that, you whitewash history, you whitewash scholarship, and you whitewash culture. So here's a couple of things we need to know. 
Nimrod, Caleb, Jethro, David, Solomon, Zephaniah, the Ethiopian eunuch, John, Mark, who are the gospel Mark, all African or people of color, or mixed genealogy. All right? Now, did you know John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, was African? He was a Cyrenian Jew, the African man. So when they try, when they say, hey, the Bible is tainted, we ain't right there. You don't know your history. There's something called Markan priority, which asserts that Mark's Gospel was actually first, and the other writers kind of use his, his book as the prototype for theirs. So you don't have to agree with Mark, you know, you could be Matthean, meaning Matthew, uh, but what you can't dispute is the Africanness of John Mark and that God used black and brown people even under the leading of the Holy Spirit to even write the scriptures. Tertullian, African. Athanasius, African. Augustine of Hippo, of the five women mentioned in Matthew's genealogy, Matthew 1, 1 through 16, four are Hamitic, African or black, uh, descent, Tamar, Rahab, Bathsheba, and Ruth. The earliest part of the New Testament we have is John Ryland Papyri, found where? Egypt, dated around 125 AD. And so here's what, I'm, here's what I hope you see here. When we're engaging people who don't believe, so if a person says, I don't believe the Bible, my next quote can't be, the Bible says. The Bible has all scriptures God reads. He, he just told me he don't, he doesn't. That means nothing to me. It means a lot to me, don't get me wrong, I'm a believer. It don't mean nothing to him. So, so now, guess what? I can argue my faith without the Bible. I can argue my faith history. And I can, I can show him that Africans believe before slavery. That, that we did not find Christ on the plantation. Many of our ancestors knew him before that. Because when they say they don't believe the Bible, y'all, while I, 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 still, I still maintain my biblical worldview, I now may have to adjust how I engage. And I'm trying to get him to the, to the gospel, because the gospel will save him, not history. But, but I need to engage his questions or her questions. I need to know a, a little bit of history. I'm not going to know all of this stuff. I'm not going to memorize everything. But, but his soul is worth me knowing some stuff to engage. There's a few. Here's a, a Tertullian. And I, I, we put this, uh, if you go to IamAppel.net, we have this on sweatshirts and shirts and uh, again, just, just different ways to color correct. So Petulian was a prolific writer and author from Carthage uh, and another influential black African man to impact the Christian faith and the world for over millennia after his death. Petulian was the first Christian author to produce an extensive quantity of Christian literature in Latin, an avid apologist, meaning he defended the faith, for the Christian faith, and a debater against he a heresy. So truly and consistently engaged uh, and confounded those that wanted to pro propagate a false gospel. He's also the one that gives us the concept of the Trinity. We can thank an African man for that. Origin. Origin of Alexandria. And I want you to look at those dates. That's over a thousand years before 1619. All right? Translate trade 1619. We're, we're in the 100s. You're talking about Roughly 1,400 years before that, there are Africans who believe that he died, he rose, and he coming back. And that, that wasn't beat in them. Thinking, I, uh, just, just for context, you can't affirm everything Origen did. He was a masochist, meaning he cut and beat himself. Uh, but uh, Origen, also known as Origen Adamantius, uh, was one of the many African Christian scholars to merge faith and reason. He was born and spent his first half of his career in Alexandria. While he influenced and served the Greek church, Oregon was indeed an African man. He was also a prolific writer. Can't leave out our lady. Perpetual and felicity. Two African female martyrs. 
Professor Felicity, uh, both of these born and died in 203D, were Christian martyrs of the third century. Professor was a married noble woman, said to have been uh, 22 years old at the time of her death for Yeshua, Christ, and a mother of a nursing infant and stood for the faith in the midst of crisis. Felicity, who stood with her and was pregnant at the time, was martyred with her. They were put to death along with others in Carthage for their faith. In fact, it's, it's, I can't remember if it was Professor Felicity, but one of them in their diary wrote how their dad tried to convince them to give up faith in Christ, and they refused. You have these first martyrs, these, these African, these Black women defending their faith. This gives a new meaning to the phrase Black Girl of Christ. Athanasius. Athanasius. Now, some of you have heard this idea of the Christianity was created at the Council of Nicaea. It was not. One of the leading voices there was this guy, Athanasius, African man, who went up against another African man by the name of Arius. So the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD, was about the essence of Jesus. Was he created or was he God in the flesh? So this is why if any of you have heard of the Nicene Creed, in the Nicene Creed it says begotten, not made. And the reason it's saying that is because he's the only begotten son, not the only created son, because we believe that Jesus is God. He's the incarnation. He's God in the flesh. So Athanasius was one of those two voices, an avid writer, a prolific um, apologist, and uh, he was the leading voice at the Council of Nicaea, an African man. All right, so Christianity, Christianity wasn't created at Nicaea, it was debated at Nicaea. All right, uh, Shenouda of a tree, uh, he gives us uh, monasticism. That's the idea of being a monk, being very reflective and uh, getting yourself away, reflective for Jesus. That comes from another African man, uh, Shenouda of a tree. One of the most prolific, Augustine of Hippo. Augustine of Hippo. Um, Again, we, he's still impacting the church, still impacting even those outside of the Christian faith. We thank another African man for that, Augustus of Hippo, uh, born in the Gaza, North Africa, present day Algeria. He has an unparalleled influence, even on Western Christianity, but again, he's been presented as a white man. But I want you to see us in history, all right? Now, some responses to whitewashing, there are three, liberation theology, uh, self-hatred, and then urban apologetics. Uh, I'm going to deal with the self-hatred one. Uh, Esau Macaulay got a great book I suggest called Reading Wild Black. And he says this, and he's talking about responses to whitewashing. He doesn't use whitewashing, is my term, he uses a different term. But he says, one sought to end racism and form a family rooted in our mutual recognition of the Imago Dei and belief in the Lordship of Christ. Uh, another group accepted the black plight and tried to make most of it, looking for it, and that's got a lot of redemption. The third is hope in uh, revolution. It is what he's saying. So liberation theology, James Cone primarily, but the thought actually precedes him, and that's in the book on liberation, uh, in the chapter on liberation. Cone was dealing with lynchings happening after service. So Cone is saying there is no home for us in white evangelicalism. So we need liberation from that. He was not trying to be liberated from Christ. Now, some of this stuff is ethnocentric, so we cannot embrace it uh, in its totality, right? Because uh, again, the gospel has to remain central. But there were others, though, who said, you know what? Let's just give in. And so chapter nine is self-hatred, the making of a coon. You, you, you'll see, and that's my book, where some blacks internalize whitewashing and just wanna, wanted the acceptance of white people. One of the biggest culprits historically, this guy here, uh, Muhammad al fasi who wrote one of the most scathing uh, articles against uh, black people as a person of color. And so you'll find more about him in the book. I wanna, I wanna get here. So here's the problem with self-hatred. Because this, the, not only, is, it's not just only like evangelicals yelling out CRT, it's a lot of black evangelicals who are primarily and predominantly white churches 
who, who see blacks who call this stuff out um, as a threat. But here's the problem with whitewash and self-hatred. It's the centrality of ethnocentrism. It makes your ethnicity the main thing. It is a rejection of the Imago Dei. God wanted you to be whatever color you are. And we should celebrate the, the rich diversity of that. It embraces inferiority and it's the deification of cultural assimilation. So when some respond to whitewashing, uh, either you had liberation that we want to get away, urban apologetics, that's what I'm doing now, is equipping the body to confront this. But then you had some who embrace self-hatred. Um, and again, come for me in the book is an acrostic con contributing to ongoing oppression through negligence. It's when people don't know that, don't know their history and just say, you know what, white is right. I'm just trying to fit in. So uh, I'm going to go to the next Ron Loritz has a good book that, that breaks this down. His book called White Color, Wrong Culture. And he breaks it up into C1, C2, C3. He says C1 is a person from one ethnicity who has assimilated to another. Biblically, he talks about the Hellenistic Jews of Acts 6. Uh, uh, another example, culturally, is called Banks from Fresh Prince. <laughs> a C2 is a person who is culturally flexible and uh, adaptable without being ethnically ambiguous or hostile. In other words, a person that doesn't have a code switch. An example, so you use Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says, I became all things to all men, but he did not give up his Jewishness. And then a cultural example is Denzel Washington. He says C3 are people who are culturally inflexible. <laughs> the example he gives are the Pharisees and Al Sharp. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so the point, though, the point he's making is that race and culture are complex, and so black people should not give in to assimilation and self hatred, but we should not be inflexible either, because God may have us in a community of faith that includes different races and cultures. Got it. The problem with self-hatred is the rejection of the Imago Dei. The primary mark of identity is our creator, not our culture. In redeeming humanity, Christ redeems culture. God intended for you to be the color you are, not as a defining marker, but as a marker of his creative genius. And let me say this, color and cultural affinity aren't inherently evil, right? So it's, it's, it's always us that somehow pro-black is perceived as anti-white. Pro-black is an anti-white. Now, some people it is, but that shouldn't be the default. Like, I, I want to see, because you can't talk about all these issues within the black community, then hate me for wanting to empower my community. To specifically want to empower my community that you just gave me all these stats, as if we got a monopoly on depravity. Right? So it's okay for us. This is why I'm doing this. Like I wanna, I wanna, I don't want to see my people separated from God for eternity. Now deification of cultural assimilation, uh, deification of cultural assimilation, I'm sorry. The dominant culture becomes the standard, it nurtures dilution, and then you'll see black people who disassociate themselves. You have some friends who are like have completely given up on the black church. They think the answer is the white church. And they find out white people send us to. We'll, we'll welcome you back. We'll, we'll keep the door. So self hatred isn't the answer. The answer, so you have liberation, liberation had its hold. Self hatred, that's, it, it rejects the biblical identity we've been given. The right answer is urban apologetics. I, I also contribute to that book. That's a book by Dr. Eric Mason, I suggest called Urban Apologetics, which shows us all these different ways we should engage and defend our faith. One of my uh, homiletical heroes, Dr. Tony Evans, he says this, our founding fathers failed to apply the principles of freedom that they were espousing to the area of race is a prominent reason why many minority individuals today are less than enthusiastic to join in with those in our nation who want to exalt or restore America's history and heritage, God's kingdom does. He's talking about the hesitancy of people to either come to the faith or for some people to want to embrace diversity, right? Y'all know some people like that because they feel like, well, once we do that, they're going to try, they're going to take over. I gave you those names already. 
I want to get, get, get to the uh, end and we can do some Q&A. We need to reject self-hatred. Self-hatred is sinful. It's not about preference. Craving acceptance from any culture to, deter to determine value is idolatry. Christ died for humanity, not a social construct. Whatever race you're craving, they are sinners too. The gospel is color and culture engaging. It is not culturally imperialistic and we should repent. The gospel is not colorblind. Don't get a badge of honor for that. God wants you to see color and, and, and remove your prejudice. That goes for all of us. Dealing with self-hatred, how, how do we help those that we're engaging now? Because you either have one stream, one extreme, I want nothing to do with Christianity. Then you have those, well, see, the, the, the black church has these extra challenges that white Washington has created for it. So you got those that is like, I don't want nothing to do with the church. Then you got those that don't want nothing specifically to do with the black church. And they think that only the black church has the prosperity gospel. They think the answer is the white church. Like, no, you, you still made the answer man and not Jesus. Right? So reject the notion that cultural assimilation defines multi ethnicity. Please, did you hear what I said? So my sister's question earlier, like black people just assimilating and you you never hit Fred Hammond again. You you never you you, you never get nothing from us. That's not the answer. Don't allow cultural affinity to be demonized. Again, being pro-black. If someone says they're pro-white, there's a difference between pro-white than you when you start saying white power, but that's different. But there's nothing wrong with having an affinity for your culture. Just make sure you don't deify. Don't allow silence on social issues. Reject religious whitewashing and the deification of ethnicity. Now, the right quick on social issues, and I wanna, I'm gonna try to land this plane. The Bible is in silence. Let me give you just this nugget. Paul in Acts 16 was a victim, listen, of police brutality. Go behind me and read it. The Bible says that the magistrates, which the Greek word translates to police or officer, join in with the crowd to beat Paul. They found out he had dual citizenship, and then they tried to release him silently. And what did Paul say? Paul said, paraphrasing, heaven to the north, you beat me, beat me publicly. You beat me publicly, but you're trying to release me silently. You, I, you, I demand an apology for the injustice that I received. So Paul protested the injustice in the text. But white evangelicals in particular want to skate over verse 5 and call you woke. It's in the word, though. I put this verse with the book I signed, Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. Because here, here's what we're trying to go. I want you to say, we went through all this, but we're still trying to get people back to Jesus. So, so Tom's going to say, the difference is I no longer go out to fight for dignity for myself because I already have it. In God's son. What, what a lot of this issue is, people are trying to understand where is black dignity, and we're saying it's found in Jesus. All dignity is found there. Now, Deva says, we, we fail to embrace a oneness perspective rooted in kingdom theology, too. So, unless we, like Joshua, surrender to the truth that God's kingdom is not here to take sides. God's kingdom is not black. God's kingdom is not white. God's kingdom is not Hispanic, nor is it Asian, Middle Eastern, or Indian. God did not come to take sides. God came to take over. And until we bow beneath the overarching rule set forth by the rule. What do we do? Awareness. We need to be aware of what's going on. We need to know. I'm not saying everybody here going to listen to the Breakfast Club or, or get a TikTok account, but to your sphere of influence, you may have to do something outside of your comfort zone. Acknowledgement. We need to acknowledge that whitewashing is and was and is a thing. We need to attack it. So my book only been out three months, but I'm sure people are going to want, if, if the Lord lets it grow, I'm going to be called a critical race theorist. I'm going to be called 
I'm going to be called anti-church, anti-white, all this stuff. Uh, be prepared to be attacked when you call out white supremacy or, or, or any form of supremacy. Number four, we need to abolish these systems of injustice. That's why we need to create curriculum that reflects an accurate narrative of Christian history in the Bible. We need to agree on what, what does the text say and be faithful to that. We need to abandon the mindsets that got us here. That goes back to the favoritism. And we need action that is rooted in the gospel that cares about human flourishing. Right? Why? Because God creates a people from all people. That's what he does. He creates a people from all people. Um, I'll send Pastor Willie this. Uh, these are some books I suggest. Woke Church, Inside or Outsider, Stand from the Beginning. Now, Stand from the Beginning, he, Dr. Ibram Kendi, he's the one that came up with the anti-racist, how to be anti-racist. He's not a Christian. He, he deconstructed his faith. But uh, Stand from the Beginning is good for historical reasons. So read that as a historic book, not as a book on your first, how it could influence you on race, okay? The Color of Compromise by Jamar Tisby, Reading While Black, Esau McCulley, Wonders and Grace, Dr. Evans, Divided by Faith, Michael Emerson, Plantation Jesus, <laughs> Scott Welch, Christian Slavery by Kathleen Gerbner, uh, The Gospel and Racial Reconciliation, Russell Moore, Gospel Hamano, uh, Dr. Vince Van Tu, and yours truly, uh, The White Washington of Christianity. And all those books I mentioned are in my book. I use 100 books to form my one book. Y'all pray that they let me use it as a dissertation for my PhD. Because I ain't trying to write it. All right. Uh, here's how you can get in touch with me for those online and here. Website is wronggayjr.com. Uh, so people at home, if you want a copy of the book, you can go there and you'll get a signed copy. Or it's on Amazon, wherever book is for. So a brother would appreciate five-star reviews because it helps the algorithm. Uh, Instagram, at Jerome Gay. Uh, Twitter, at Jerome Gay. I never thought I would open this up because I'm 42, but TikTok uh, at Jerome Gay 2 and then Facebook Pastor Jerome Gay Jr. I want to end with this uh, massive versus massive. So this guy's named Josiah Henson. And uh, Josiah Henson uh, escaped from slavery and he traveled abroad. He visited his old plantation where his master had died, uh, his former owner, right? And the wife of his former owner, this guy got his, his own freedom. She called him Sai for short. His name is Josiah. She said, Sai, your master has died. Josiah responded this way, no, madam, my master is yet alive. He knew that no white man owned him. His true master was his creator. So even though whitewashing has been going on for centuries, Black people who know the Lord know that my master is still alive. Amen? That is it. So we're opening up for questions. I'm not going to look this way. We're going to open up. <laughs> we're going to open up for questions. And thank you so much. I'm sorry if I, I, think, I think I know I went over a little bit. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. How do you balance, I guess, and my question might sound kind of jumbled because it's all in the head. How do you balance, and even teaching our children, that, you know, from the outside, they see the skin tone, yeah. but on the inside, the identity is a problem. I'm sorry, I'm getting lost. No, it's okay. But, you know, because we see people out here, you know, a black person or a white person. Yeah. And our children, you know, yeah. will see that first because they're, they're not knowledgeable about, you know, all that we're learning. How do you even balance it and teach them that is there even a balance or is it just, you know, identity in Christ? Yeah. And that your intellect, in essence, but not matter to him. But I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I wrestle with this because, again, my, my, my children are at predominantly white Christian school that, that, for the most part, still has a whitewashed curriculum. And again, I, I talked to the principal, so so some things changed. I, I wanted to always emphasize, you know, Jamari, that's my daughter, my son, middle name Jordan, called him Jordan. I, we, Crystal and I, my wife, we emphasize that Jamari and Jordan is again, the foundation of your identity is Christ. And, but your blackness is not a strike. 
You have to stop telling our kids you already got one strike against you. I don't affirm that. Now, some people may see your blackness as a strike. But your mom and daddy don't, nor does God, and neither should you. And I want to affirm who they are in him and say, all right, that's the foundation of your identity. But God, in his infinite wisdom, he made you the color that you are. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And we can celebrate it. But just don't make that the main identity marker. Because people don't go to heaven because of the color they see. Go to heaven based on faith in Christ and his finished work. So I want to always emphasize that for them. And and correct them when they when they come. Because my, my daughter's a teenager. She's 16. So she's seeing stuff and hearing stuff. And we, we monitor stuff. But, you know, she's going to hear different perspectives even from these Christian students. And, you know, all the students ain't Christian at Christian school. And so, so she's hearing stuff, and I want to help her kind of navigate. Like, so when she uses the term white privilege, I'm like, what, what does that mean, school? Don't just say stuff you hear. Make sure you know what you're talking about. Like, what, what do you mean when you say that? Right? So I always challenge her there. I'm like, you don't want to just repeat stuff people are saying on TV and have no context, and you might end up misusing it and viewing race through the wrong lens. So I think I want to affirm their blackness. But I want it to be under the foundation of Christ and not your blackness is not your foundation. And then I want to make sure I'm engaging, like what conversations I'm just having. When, when the stuff happens on, um, when we talk about the abortion law in Texas, like, all right, why, why is mommy and daddy, we, we use the term whole life instead of pro life, because we care about the life out there. What, what do you, how are you wrestling with that? How does God work in the realm of choice? And yes, we want you to choose life. What does this mean when, when George Floyd happens? Right, so we're talking through all these things. You, I would say just constantly engage your children and allow them space to process. Don't overcorrect. So remember their teenagers or whatever age your children are, allow them that space to, to process. And then apologize when you go for what I've had to say, I'm sorry, quite a few times. Is that it? Is that it? Well, I got a question. Uh -oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> How would you, uh, we know that no, no particular ethnicity is monolithic, right? Especially right. blacks, right? We don't Absolutely. always agree and we don't see if they don't have the same life experiences. Yep. But how do you address those who are, they're obviously coons, you know? <laughs> and, 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 and yet we say, well, we know we're different, but yet you can kind of see their agenda yeah. to really promote more whiteness and yeah. assimilation. So yeah. what are your thoughts on, do you engage them or do you engage those around them, maybe listening to them? Uh, yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, so I do both. So, um, so uh, online, right? So we, I'm a part of different groups and Candace Owens always comes up, right? So I'm just gonna say her name. So, so Candace Owens always comes up. And, and well, here's what I say, I say, listen, I, you can't dismiss everything Candace said. I know you want to, because you don't like the source. You don't like her. But, and, and she seems to dance in white spaces, right? But I said, no, some of the stuff she says about black responsibility is true. Truth is true, regardless of the source, right? Now, how you do it can be coony. And so that's why I made it an acrostic contributing to ongoing oppression through negligence. And so where people like her, I think they neglect the other side of the narrative that, okay, not everyone, not every black person who comes against police brutality is pro-choice. Not every black person who comes against police brutality is anti-police or they don't even agree with defund the police. They're like, look, we want to fund the police, but we want when you show up, I want my son to make it home. They don't mean that, I don't hear black people say, I don't want no cops. I don't know, nobody, nobody black told me that, that they don't want cops. They, they want good cops. So I think I, I want to emphasize nuance within the black community. They're pro-choice black, pro-life black, <clears throat> liberal, they're Democrats who are pro-life. Like we, they're, we are, ne we never have been and never will be monolithic. So I think I want to engage and say, but specifically for my community, like we, we must hold each other accountable if we're actually going to achieve the empowerment that we say we want. We, we cannot escape the things that we do that hurt ourselves. 
right? Now, again, I know there are reasons. I get it. I know the systemic reasons behind it. But at the end of the day, if we make it, if we're making those decisions, we, we need to be held accountable. But in terms of the coonery, I want to I, I confront that head on and say you're placating, you're playing, you're dancing, and you're you're literally dehumanizing your own people for the sake of people that don't really care about you. You're a part. They're using you. And then the moment you're no longer useful, they will dismiss you. So I I, I deal with, with both sides. Yeah, we got a few questions in the chat. All right. Uh, the first one, by presenting this to the ch current Christian church and the current culture, what effects do you have on the body? Other than shifting in the mood to have passion and about black and his role in black physical history. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I think the fact that we're having an event like this is, I, and I did a virtual event a couple of weeks ago, like I've, I've been being invited because some churches are re just realizing, not not you guys, you guys have been doing this, but some churches are just now realizing the need for apologetics and training. And it's like, hey, it's better, it's better late than never. So I think that's a good thing that we're having this discussion. I think it, it's going to help empower people. It, it's going to equip our children. Because ultimately, in order for our faith to survive, in a sense, in terms of outliving us, it's going, it's, it's your children's ministry now. Your children's ministry now is the legacy of Mount Zion. The children's ministry of vision is the legacy of Vision Church. And so if we are equipping our parents to know how to equip their children to defend the faith, then we, we have the legacy of faith. We don't want that testimony of the book of Joshua and another generation rose up and they did not know God. And so we don't want that to be our testimony. And so teaching this, and again, still keeping the gospel as the main thing. I hope y'all hear that. I ended with a whole bunch of slides about the gospel, right? Because exposing whitewashing doesn't save, it informs. The gospel is what saves. And so still getting back uh, to that. So that, I think we just, we got to keep equipping. And if you're in a space, I don't know, I assume that everyone that's watching is a member of Zion, you know, really actual, actual leadership. Don't, don't, don't be belligerent, but actual leadership. If you like, if you don't have things like this, can you bring in people? I think that's the thing is I, there are things I'm not good on. So as a pastor, be willing to bring in others that have put in the work that that can equip your body with things like this. That's how I would answer that. Another question: Do you find that the emotionalism of the expression in the black church culture keeps in the historical context? people try to remove the expression. Yeah, so so I don't I don't I'm definitely not an advocate of removing the expression because of the Bible. Like I you don't see one not one emotionless response to salvation by grace through faith. People run, people dance, Mary pulled out a tangerine and etchings, right? That was literally a praise break. <laughs> when they got through the Red Sea, right? So uh, I, I, we, we should not remove emotion, but we got to offer more than emotion. So it's like, I, I don't want this monotone, expressionless liturgy. Now I realize that some people watch it that way. We don't. <laughs> but, you know, so even that we don't we can't either, right? So we want to celebrate that. But the Bible, the issue was, here's what Paul said. They had a zeal without knowledge. So we want to have both. I want to have the exuberant worship. I want to have the expression, the clapping, the moving, the dancing, the jumping. I want to have that. But I want to know why. Why am I jumping? Why am I dancing? I don't want to use church as an energy drink. I want to really know why I'm dancing, why my hands are lifted. So we just got to make sure we do both. Don't lose the zeal. But make sure with that zeal, you're informing your people that they, they know their stuff. We got another one on the line right there. What are your views of the current going on in, the, uh, in terms of whitewashing <laughs> and infiltration into true faithful Bible believing churches? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I've, uh, I've um, 
So before he, he just recently changed. I've had conversations with Gene, was the president of CC. I consider him a friend. Have related with him, um, and I should comment on him in, in the book. Um, so I, I I do address it slightly. I would say, uh, I, you know, I've been disappointed. I was disappointed by the college president saying, you know, statement on CRT because there's an emphasis there, but there's there's no confront no confronting white Christian nationalism. And I think if you do both, because now CRT, there's no redemption in it. So I, it, it's worth to be critiqued. There's no redemption in critical race theory. So Christians can't embrace it in its totality. But when you talk about CRT, that you don't confront Christian nationalism, then you're being duplicitous. And so I think that's part of the problem. I know a lot of people are leaving. We, we recently decided as a church, and we've been, you know, uh, we're going to finish out this year, but then we're leaving SBC. Uh, in 2022. Uh, again, I'm not putting that on every black leader. I'm not saying people who stay at home. That's not what I believe. I have some good brothers still that will still remain. Uh, but for us, and I think the context and what I'm seeing and the questions I'm getting, we decided that it was just no longer uh, good for our church to be a part of. Yeah, you said he called me if you're uh... Okay. That's it. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Smile Guy and our family. I appreciate it. Hey, man. Come on, y'all can do better. Let's give him another hand. Well, I'll thank God for Kathy Brown. Thank you, Sam. So good. So you were definitely again, if you have not gotten this book, I would highly recommend it. Um, you also mentioned uh, Dr. Mason's book, Urban Apologetics, as we know you're any of those resources. We'll send that out. As well, so in case you didn't catch it, we'll send that out uh, that slide so that you can have that. So we can continue to equip ourselves the way to talk. And uh, Pastor Roma, will you here? Uh, you, you still need to buy our book from him. Uh, he's going to be available for that. But we're so very thankful for him coming in and sharing uh, for this hard and all this hard work that he has put in place in Christ. So for you all uh, who are here, we don't have a hand, we've got a, a paper evaluation. We'll be sending out, we registered, we'll send out an evaluation survey shortly after we um, get that. So please take a moment, fill out, give us your feedback, uh, especially in terms of any future topics that you may be interested in. So uh, we want to equip the body of Christ, and that's what we want to do through sessions like this. But we thank you guys for coming. It's Saturday morning, taking some time out to join us. Uh, but please take some time to read Pastor Jerome. Uh, someone else who don't know it, take this information back and be encouraged to do some good, solid research. Don't do all your research, young people. Uh, it's on YouTube without any resources and, and references and footnotes and don't go to any where where are you getting this information? Watch YouTube videos all day long, but anybody can say anything about any source. Uh, and that's that's a good thing. And he's got he's got he's got plenty of sources in his book and so you have a place to go back and check in on him and research and see those things for yourself. And I think I appreciate that scholarship that he has brought forth in that book. All right. Well, I'm going to pray and dismiss us and uh, hope you have a blessed day. Uh, and it's you tomorrow. Father, we thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, we're just thank you that for each of us here, you have made us in your image. We thank you for the Almighty God. You are the creator. And you are, you are, I love that, King Jesus, God, you do not make us all the same. We're diverse, even in our ethnicity, we may all be a little bit of us, maybe black, but even in that we are diverse. And you may give us skin tone, uh, uh, skin tone, and a melon level, God, we're so thankful that in the end of the day, we will see you in the tribe, nation, and uh, represent in your kingdom. What a glorious thing that will be. But God, until that time comes, I pray, you will use us. As a vessel to expose whitewash and talk about these, these issues and these matters because so far at stake, we want to be good apologists and evangelists to go out into our neighborhoods and our communities and tell the truth of the gospel. And now Christianity is not a white man's religion, but it, Christianity is for all people. It's just saving all kinds of people, not just Jews, but Gentiles. God, we're so thankful for that. God, as we bless Pastor Jerome, bless his effort, open up doors for him in order to get this message out that we are blessing 
to the culture, the community, and to the church. Bless this family, God, and bless all of our families. We thank you and we praise you. We give your name the honor and all the glory. Bless us as we gather tomorrow as we worship you. Wow, of who you are. And then because we know who you are, God. Oh my goodness, we're going to give you praise and honor because we know what you have done for us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the filling of your Holy Spirit. We pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you all. Be blessed. We'll see you next time.